everyone just saying hello. I'm going to mute myself now. Give it another couple minutes for uh, a few other folks are joining. All right. I guess we can uh, get started here. Oh, wait, there we go. Um, so uh, we'll get started, but but just to kind of um, uh, you know, sort of a well. First, let me actually um say that uh so we have a few new folks who have joined um and before kind of going through all of them i uh, wanted to sort of uh introduce ben here um who will be helping uh lead up uh today's meeting uh ben do you want to introduce yourself a little bit yeah sure hi everyone i'm ben cotton i use he him pronouns uh, i just joined kusari as the open source community lead so i'll be helping um uh, with the Guac community helping us to become, uh, you know, grow and be sustainable. Um, you may know me from my previous work as Fedora Program Manager or author of uh, Program Management for Open Source Projects, available from the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Um, I've been around open source communities um, in both volunteer and paid capacity for uh, going on 15 years now, I guess. Um, so I'm really excited to to work with this community and um, meet everyone and, uh, yeah. I will say I'm also, um, particularly excited, uh, because I am a two-time Purdue alumnus, um, and I know, uh, Purdue University has a very strong, uh, tie to the Guac Project. So, uh, you know, that makes it even better for me from a personal standpoint.
All right. Uh, we'll actually uh, throw it over to um, uh, the rest of the community here and see, uh, is there anybody else who is new to this meeting who wants to introduce themselves? All right. Uh, if there's nobody else who's new, we can kind of get into, um, uh, there's been a couple of um, uh, updates to the community ladder. Um, Parth, I think you, you have uh, some details on that one uh, since... Uh, Yes, uh, I don't think he's actually on the call, uh, but I think we discussed it last time. I think uh, Marco was on the call, but I think he was there was a promotion for him in terms of the community ladder, as well as uh, Dijon. Um, so those have been uh, formalized and uh, uh, added into Guac, and also uh, recently, uh, based on based on the contributions and the work that Marco has done. So Marco from uh, Google, uh, different from Marco that's on the call currently. Um, it has also been given the title of reviewer uh, on on the API because he 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 he's the one that originally started the REST API work, um, and has done a lot of work around that and 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 brought that into you know much more and a much more mature state than where it was initially. Um, so congratulations to uh, everybody that's especially uh, Marco that you know new, that newly joins um, the reviewers. Um, so next up on the, uh, list here is, um, uh, Guac Analyze, uh, Soam is, uh, gonna show off a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I have been working on in addition to Guac 1, a command addition to Guac 1, which allows you to, um, basically find a unified tree diff between two S bombs. Very recently we added two more operations to it, which is um, union as well as intersect. So basically you provide it to URIs and um, it spits out the the path differences between the trees of those two has S bombs. Uh, and also tells you if any of those two paths uh, can be closely related and what will be the difference between um, those two sets of paths. Uh, I can quickly do a demo. So I have my GraphQL server running here and also I've ingested um, all of the S-bonds from the Guag uh, data repository. So uh, once this is merged into Guac1, we, we can just use type in Guac1. But for now, I'm just going to type in Guac run main.go, analyze. And if you want to do a diff and provide our two as uh, URIs. And I've pre selected two as bombs I want to diff, uh, which will be the cube API server version 1.24.1 and 2. So just uh, differing with the patch versions, I'm going to steal this first URI. And with the second one, So it shoots out um, two pairs of paths and their differences at their bottom. The only real differences we should observe here is um, the the differences caused by uh, the patch versions. So that's what we see here. The name cube API so 1.24.1 uh, is different from 1.24.2. One and a few changes or uh, differences here between uh, the digest for any dependency packages. Uh, and, and then that's constant between all of the paths that differ. 
and they only differ because uh, of the batch batch versions. And these are very similar as bombs, so that's that is what we expected as well. Any questions I can answer? So that the way to uh, to actually understand the data, right? Like it shows the first part, the sh first part is showing the the version one dot two dot four, and then the one built after it is showing version one dot two twenty four dot one, and then that's like the diff between the two. Right, so this so, one, this one path uh, constructed from uh, one S bomb tree, and this is from the other, and then it compares both of both these paths and finds what differences they would have in terms of each node. Uh, and I see it's, the output is kind of misaligned here, and this is because of the uh, table right I'm using. But this first uh, is the difference for these two nodes, and this would be uh, the difference for these two nodes, even though they, they're kind of clubbed together. Just because of the table lighter uh, not accepting strings of the very different lens. So ideally, this should just be uh, one appearing here, one difference, which is the, the patch version causing the difference. Does that answer your question? So, so that's basically saying that the there are two files that have different hashes, right? Between the different versions. Right. Okay. Is there anything else? Can you scroll up? Is there any other changes except for files? Uh, this is the most prominent difference we can observe. And since we don't see uh, a second set of differences here, all the other nodes are the same, and the only difference is just the patch versions, like like we originally expected for these very two very similar S bombs to have. So why are there multiple outputs then? If there's only is there only one change? So, or uh, changes. The these nodes are entirely different. Um, the ones that are, are on the right column. Um, so but each path has uh this one um, common node. So that's why it's, it's shooting out um, all these many differences, even though it's just one node. Does that make sense? Because the hashes are different, right? I guess, so, you know, actually SHA-256 is different between each, right? So is it different files? Or, yeah, I guess I'm getting confused by the output. Um, so th this, let me just explain it uh, uh, once more real quick. So this is this is the path created from one SBOM and this is from another. And um, even though it says that these these two nodes from on, in the right column, they are the same. They have one previous node in the path. Uh, which has a name with a slightly different patch version. So that is why it's only uh, calling these two parts as different, but it also tells you that the only difference it has is uh, the patch versions being different. So then why is it being outputted multiple times though? Same thing. Uh, these nodes would be, these nodes are different. So it's creating different parts because all these nodes are connected to th this node. Oh, uh, okay. I see. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's like a dependency kind of thing. That's what right. you're trying to show here. Exactly. So it's a direct dependency to that thing. Okay. Okay, so you're basically showing like a, a pathway between the two things. Okay. I get it. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's, it is a hard thing to show, you know, how, how do you want to effectively show this? Or what's like the most intuitive way to show it? So well, that makes sense. And I think this is what we expected from uh, uh, differing these two as bonds as well.
Yep. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. It should be very minimal. So. Any other questions I can answer? Um, is any of this public yet? Uh, like, is any of this um published somewhere yet, or uh, not yet? I I have a PR. Um, uh, I think. Uh, I think of course the latest set of code. I just need to make a few more changes with what the screenshots have. I haven't updated the, updated the screenshots from uh, last time. So once that's done, I think this would be ready for a review. Cool. Yep, I saw something that looks really good. And this is all graph based. Do you want to explain a little bit about how exactly it's it's doing the actual diff? I think that'd be very interesting too. All right. So it um it pulls the S bomb using the URI from the GraphQL server. It comes in as a has S bomb struct. Um and I, I create a graph out of it. And one that graph uh, is ensured that you know each time you would create a graph, the graph is the same no matter how many times you create created. So I'm ensuring that stability is there. Uh, I find all the paths that would exist in those graphs between the two S bombs um, and the respective graphs. And then we find which uh, paths are really missing from uh, both between those two graphs. And that's what I that's when uh, what I output. But before I output would output the, the the paths, I also find the differences between um, uh, each path in one graph against uh, all the paths in the other graph, and try to find two pairs that are uh, two paths where are, which are very alike. And that's what you see here. So the only difference they have is um, the patch version differing and nothing else. So uh, it forms these pairs, and if it's not able to find a viable pair, it spits it out as a uh, as a path that does not exist in uh, exists in one graph and does not exist in the other. That's is great. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Cool. Uh, thanks again. That that looks really cool. Looking forward to seeing the um, you know, well, one is poking around with the it in the PR and seeing it kind of get merged in. Um. Cool. So next up, um, is Jeff regarding the V zero dot six release and the blog post about it. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um. So. For those of you all that have been following Guac for a while, you may may come as a surprise, but like we we've had a code in Guac that works with databases for a long time, like the Arango code and the Neo4j code and even the the Ant Postgres code. But it's all has it has been like kind of incomplete, uh, and we've been deciding you know what what do we want to use as a persistent backend for a while. Um, Last month, I believe Parth, you showed off the the end code was complete. So we, you know, as uh, everybody as a project kind of got together and agreed that um, this would become supported. Uh, so if uh, I dropped a couple of links in the um, in the notes in the main readme for Guac, we have kind of the definition of supported, where essentially uh, any any updates to the API or to the Quark, um, you know, Quark UL backends, uh, all the maintainers and and contributors are kind of agreed to keep all the supported backends up to date with uh, fully and fully completed. So, um, as of you know last week, we did the release, uh, the the in memory backend and the um, Postgres backend are going to be fully complete, optimized, and supported going forward. Uh, as far as like foreseeable future, that's what we want to, to focus on and keep up to date. Um, and that's not to say that any ba other backends can't be updated as well. Um, they're there. And if contributors uh, want to keep them 
keep them updated, that's okay as well. We'd, we'd be open for that. But yeah, again, just, you know, congratulations to the whole project, I guess, as uh, we, we actually can run Guac uh, in a way that you can ingest your ass bombs, keep them and keep them around if you're serving, if you want to restart your service and in a, in a way that we want to, um, you can do this persistently and, and plan for Guac to, the Guac service to like stick around for, you know, as a, as a storage for all of your ass bomb. So thanks for everybody, the hard work, especially um, Ivan, who's not here, who, who kicked it off, Marco R, who did the bulk of the work and, and Parth, who kind of got it over the finish line. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, well, we have the official release and then, you know, plan to, to rely on Postgres and, and, uh, you know, if you want to build, uh, a Guac deployment in your organization and, and, you know, settle on that, that you should be safe to do so. Comments, questions? All right, uh, move on to the next one, Mike. Sure, cool. Yeah, thanks again, and good good job, everybody who uh, participated in the v0.6 release. Um, so next up here is a uh, new contributors recognition. Um, Parth and Jeff, I know you 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 have a bit more of a background on exactly uh, those contributions. So do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yes. Um, so just calling out new contributions, uh, you know, in terms of people contributing features as well as, you know, we've been, tag we've been tagging things, uh, as help wanted, you know, good first issues. So a lot of, uh, new contributors have been coming on board and as trying, trying to help out. And I think gaining a lot of, like getting a lot of insight into the, you know, the, how Guac works and, and helping us, you know, finish up some of the features that we're, we're looking to finish up. Um, so, you know, some of the people are, I'm going to call out are, uh, and I linked those PRs specifically into, um, in the agenda, but like, uh, Bibi Bibi, I hopefully I'm pronouncing all the names right, but, <laughs> uh, the username, Bibi Bibi. And then there's also been, uh, Narza, who's actually done a, uh, uh who's joined on the Kusari side, but he's, he's done some, uh, con considerable amount of work, uh, getting some of the a lot of the open features, um, getting a lot of bug fixes in, as well as getting the, uh, you know, the collector subscriber to, you know, as, as data kind of grows in Guac, we want to make sure that work, it's able to scale properly. So one of the challenges was like, it, it, it it's, um, uh, it's not able to, you know, you have to handle all the, all the, the multiple workloads. So the collector subscriber needs to be updated. So a lot of that stuff got updated. Um, and then some others, uh, Rick shut, uh, you know, had, he helped us get, uh, you know, Uber or Golang mock was going out of service, or I think it was getting deprecated. So getting that, some of that stuff updated. And then finally, uh, Yashvir, uh, he's been adding, you know, he did helped us with some Cyclone BX parsing and as well as, um, one of the features that actually John on the call has asked about is adding metadata to, um, uh, you know, ability to add custom metadata to uh, some of these nodes. So creating a CLI around that. So that's also been, been uh, a PR has been created for that. So thanks to all the new contributors. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, okay. So actually before I do the updates to meetings, um, thing, uh, let's go to Alex and Ridwan to talk about proposal for is running nodes. Uh, yeah. So recently we discussed about is deployed nodes, <clears throat> but we are realizing that we would like to also store runtime data in the in the graph as well. Um, so this is so that way we can trace from a CVE all the way up to a running image. Uh, I'm not sure if this has been discussed before, but I just wanted to get some thoughts on that and we can start drafting a proposal. 
Sure. Yeah. I I think it, it, we have discussed it a couple of times here and there in the past. I think one of the biggest challenges we've come across is um, runtime data is a very, it, it changes a lot. And right. so when it comes to uh, like, and then given that we've built everything out in a graph, it can become essentially uh, like a problem in, in, in updating a lot of that information. The other thing I think that's also a bit of a challenge is, um, you know, Guac is very focused on supply chain observability, but then it kind of goes into the other bit of observability of like, okay, now it's runtime visibility. And um, this is not to say that we don't want to necessarily um, have some capability for that, like a, you know, a way to integrate or whatever. But I think our big concern is, is all of a sudden the majority of data that's flowing through would kind of transition, like, especially if you look at it from like the perspective of Kubernetes as an example, um, you know, and how, like, are we talking about runtime? Like this is just running in this container in this Kubernetes cluster, or is it, Hey, it's running in this pod. And as the pod scales up and scales down, we're going to include additional data. And then that quickly becomes, you know, we don't really do a lot of pruning of existing data in Guac today. And so we'd have to really start thinking through like, how do you say that, Hey, this data now is stale because we've actually taken down this, um, you know, we've taken down this running service. And so now this service is not running in this cluster anymore, not running in this pod. So there's, there's a couple of questions there. Now, with that said, that doesn't necessarily mean we wouldn't have some way of, let's say, linking in, like here is, you know, an is running node and that is running node has a link to something that can then, you know, keep the runtime um, status. And then we would just, you know, continue the query on there. So that, that's definitely something, but I think one of the big challenges, and I'm, I'm interested to hear other folks' thoughts as well, is just um, it becomes very complicated to start to go and say like, well, these systems are running on, on these nodes, and then these dependencies are both running as their own services on these, you know, in these servers, but not on these servers. And, you know, it becomes this kind of very, very big uh, thing. And, and then we also need to start addressing all of the like normal runtime monitoring concerns. Um, and like, where is that data being populated from? And should it be considered like, you know, consistent or more of just like a, Hey, this is an indicator that is probably running here. Um, but I think that's one of the, the big concerns, uh, there, uh, Ben. Yeah. I was, you know, thinking about it from, you know, my sysadmin days, like having that kind of information would be super helpful. But I think from a project standpoint, we would want to have like an API that tools can use to just update the is running and not try and um, do any of the checking on our side. You basically just have it be uh, something else tells Guac what the status is. Um, because one, that's going to be a lot easier to scale out to multiple things that we support. But also, I think it just simplifies. Um, you know, the code base for us to try and maintain going on, you know, on the long-term basis. I mean, I would be interested to understand, you know, Alex and Ridwan's, you know, your use case around this. And have you thought about like, hey, you know, adding some of this information to a graph, you know, would make it explode? And how would you handle some of that stuff? Like, did you have, did you, did you have any deeper thoughts around that or? Or you guys was like, this is an initial idea and you were kind of like throwing it out there. Yeah, this is more of an initial idea. Uh, Red one. Hey, yeah, it looks like my camera's not working. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of what folks think the appropriate model should be here because to me it, it does sound like like there's so many concerns with trying to get this data into the graph but the value of the joining of the data is really really high so it's like maybe there's a model in which we build some sort of extensibility where we have a way to join the data kind of like what mike was alluding to where it's like or and Ben as well, where you, you basically have like a pointer to some sort of data set that is mutating or constantly updating. Um, but I, I don't know how to quite articulate it exactly, but 
I think that seems like a better model than just like having a static node that it lives in the graph that needs to be updated or removed or deleted. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I'm also going to kind of go back on my, my background as like a sysadmin and, 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 uh, very focused in like monitoring tools and those sorts of things and like time series data and all that. Yeah, I think it, it it's going to require a little bit of time to kind of think through because there's, uh, I think the to, to give folks some additional context, there is definitely like um, a good way of thinking about, I, at least in my opinion, a good way of thinking about like, this is allowed to be deployed, right? Like, you know, this has been approved for deployment or whatever. This has passed all these checks. And then you can query that graph, um, you know, uh, to kind of sort sort that sort of thing out. Um, uh, I think the 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 challenge kind of comes in when you know, like, you start to look at like CMDBs and other other monitoring tools of like you know, like a OS query, for example, of like, okay, what's running on this server or what's running in this environment? And then there's also various you know, uh, Kubernetes related monitoring tools that essentially just dump the state of what all the things that are running on Kubernetes at a given time once, let's say, you know, they pull once every ten minutes or something like that. So you have an up to date understanding, or even as actually as things change, the, the, it triggers events uh, to do those sorts of things. Um, actually, one thing I think is probably worth thinking through a little bit here is is cloud events and CD events and how those are sort of related in there because a lot of folks are leveraging cloud events as a way of, oh, well, CD events, which is a, um, which is a sort of uh, uh, schema on top of cloud events. Um, but using the events like, hey, this thing got spun up as a way to trigger these things and then potentially allowing lots of different mechanisms to to actually you know store that data for for querying or whatever um but I think that's something to you know for for Alex and Ridwan to 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 maybe explore there as well um Parth um so this is a question for Ridwan is I was like I know you know Certech had the an idea of using like a Kubernetes you know agent to monitor some of this stuff like have you does he have any thoughts around this or have you spoken to him about that because I know he was like, you know, with the Quark AI MLA, he's like, oh, we can query runtime with Quark, right? And marry that together. Um, was there any ideas that he had or what, you know, maybe some initial uh, initial diagrams or like, hey, maybe you can use this agent or this is how it would work? Yeah, I mean, I think the the challenge with that, having the agent is that you would need to be able to deploy that agent in every cluster across an organization, which you know ultimately you might end up doing something like that in anyways but the i think difference is that uh like it would be in my opinion better to generate some sort of attestation as opposed to like having something that you can go and fan out queries across many many different clusters um but yeah we can continue that I, I think the the interface like that uh, of like an AI interface makes a lot of sense, but I just don't know about the actual having like an agent running everywhere that that can query the state because that could also get a little um, a little tricky. Yeah. So but, how, uh, go ahead. how were you thinking about generating the attestation in the first place? Like, where would they be generated and for this so, runtime stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, just the the idea that we're spitballing right now is essentially having um, a attestation get generated and of like what's happening on this cluster at, uh, like a snapshot essentially of what's happening on a cluster that gets uploaded to a blob storage. That blob storage would, that blob would be set with a TTL. So essentially that it would kind of automatically clean itself up. Um, and then we would, ingest that data into Guac. Um, and then from that point on, we we ha would have a updating set of nodes that are constantly getting like on a on like some sort of cadence. So this is kind of like an early proof of concept to, to kind of prove the idea out. But obviously from a scalability perspective, we have to really think through what makes sense for like real production scenarios.
Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, the challenge always comes to like, it, when it comes to this sort of runtime thing that, that I, I agree that like, you don't want to kind of just constantly be querying like another API for let's say what is what is necessarily running. The, the challenge though becomes like, in certain cases, right? Like, and I, I guess, I guess there's, there's there, to kind of, I think we probably want to kind of push a little bit harder on what really is the use case, because like, it's going to look very different, you know, if you're taking a step back and you're like, okay, what is deployed to this physical server? That's probably not changing very often. What's deployed to a VM or is that VM changing, whatever, that's going to be a little bit more common. And then when you start to go into like the Kubernetes and, and cloud world, like, I, I have seen, you know, this this application runs every night for thirty seconds. Um, you know, so is that like, like, do you want to capture that information, and and do you want to capture that information that like, hey, it runs nightly at this time, or it runs persistently, and so there's a lot of like open questions there. So I, uh, as you're thinking through this, I think like, and to be clear here, I think this is where um, if if you're uh, kind of like helping lead this, uh, you know, uh, node, you know, building out what this node might look like. Um, I definitely have like a whole lot of questions that I, I think we we should figure out how to answer. Like, you know, yeah, how often should this thing get updated? If we are sending attestations, right? You know, how often do those attestations get sent out? Like, um, should we even be, for example, tr like should we be triggering this both on deployment and scale up, scale down time? Um, you know, what happens if the server crashes or something like that? Like the, the server that like this thing is running, uh, crashes and is getting restarted. Is that like, Hey, it's not running for these 10 minutes or, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of like, I think open questions there that I, I'd be interested to kind of, ex uh, explore. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I think ultimately the, the real use case is like. You know, you have log4j running somewhere where where is my vulnerability present as opposed to like, because I mean, obviously, there's so many shift left types of things that, you know, organizations are doing today to eliminate the possibility of vulnerability. But once a vulnerability is running, we need to know how to go rectify that. So that's like the real core use case that we're chasing is is that particular piece because inventorying where vulnerability is running is extremely difficult problem. And Guac obviously gets us like a lot of the way there, but not that final jump of like to what's running. So I think that's the thesis behind the the proposal. Now, obviously getting there is a completely different, <laughs> you know, challenge. So th that's kind of what we're just wanting to get some brainstorming going, but yeah. we, we don't have to take the full time for, for the rest of this conversation. It's more, a lot of open questions still. Oh, well, I mean, looking at the agenda, I think there's nothing um, other than just uh, a request here to to uh, whether or not we should be having more often uh, meetings for exactly these sorts of conversations. Um, but so so I, I guess uh, we can cut it off when when we need to. But I, I actually one of the things that I think is also worthwhile just kind of considering here is um, does it make sense to maybe go the other way around where you would have some sort of runtime monitoring solution that when you go and you ask, like it knows it has these things running on it. Great. When you request for, okay, great. What's the the supply chain of the things that are running on that system? Then it queries Guac. That might be something to also consider is like going the other way around as opposed to necessarily expecting the information to live in Guac. It's more of connecting the information from some upstream monitoring tool into Guac um, as, as something to, to consider as well. Yeah. But yeah. Once again, yeah. I think we're open to to all these things. I think we just need to sit down and and explore them. Yeah, uh, Alex, do you have any other thoughts here? Um, not at the moment. It does sound like we have quite a bit to think through. Um, but yeah, Rudon and I can brainstorm some more on this. Also, feel free to, you know, okay. once again, you know, talk about it in the Slack and and post stuff in there, you know, because I'm I'm sure there's going to be a lot of folks other than just the group of folks who are here on this call who probably have thoughts around this. Um, 
and and probably even folks on this call who are probably mulling it over right now and are thinking like, oh, I should probably think of how well, like what we would probably want out of something like this. So so definitely, you know, feel free to to post about it in in chat as well, and on you know GitHub issue. Uh, Parth. I'm so uh, is this on top of the is deployed? Or are you thinking about this being a replacement for that? Yeah, so one of the challenges that is deployed that we've recently been talking about is the fact that like things like admission controllers and like how coop scheduling works, like it, those they're two distinct concepts is what we think when we think about it. Like is deployed is like a person took an action to to make a change to the production system and like, you know, it's kind of maybe how you think about how a CV gets introduced into an environment and tracing that back whereas is running is like the the CV is like present uh in some way so they're pretty complementary but after thinking about it more there's a, definitely some some challenges with like just having one or the other um you get a full picture with i think when you have both um there's also some more intricacies around like manifest lists with when it comes to containers and and also like you might you don't know which platform you're deploying for a container image until it actually gets scheduled onto a cluster and at the deployment time you'll just know that a tag points to a manifest list so there's a lot of different nuances there that we need to kind of sort through and it's kind of why we started landing towards more like is running for the core scenario that we're talking about but i think it's important to know who deployed something yeah. as well I mean, just just having that knowledge of like, oh, it is it it did get deployed. It's better than nothing. Where it's like, okay, that it is actually something that could be running out there in an environment. Um, is is better than not knowing. It's like, hey, is this thing actually running or not? I have no idea. Let's we got to go scan everything to figure it out. So maybe at least having some kind of a, you know, the loop or a an attestation that's saying like, yes, it did get deployed. Not sure if it's running anymore, but like, yes, there is like a. A thing that says like yeah it did get deployed and this is the time and the version and so forth but no i think maybe it does make sense to be complementary but i think that's going to be a, a larger question and more of the further discussions um jeff yeah just not to dissuade you all but uh i think that like kind of where guac is today a lot of the idea was that some you know some organization already had some kind of scanning going on. Like they already had a runtime scanner that said like, hey, your container has vulnerabilities or a artifact scanner says, hey, your artifact has vulnerabilities. And that that Guac was the tool was like, was like the analysis tool. It's like, okay, this has vulnerabilities, but that doesn't tell me enough to go and fix the problem. So I need this graph of like my supply chain to understand my supply chain. So you know, kind of two questions or like one statement, one one question. The statement is kind of like, yeah, so we didn't design it so much in the, in the like where it's like representing the current state. You know, we were thinking that like maybe you had that, had that already. Um, so this is, that's kind of why it needs a lot of like thought and and careful um, consideration, which I think, you know, we, we, we want to do. Um, the question is like, do you have, is that something that you already have? Like, do you have a, a, a scanner or, you know, container vulnerability reporting for, for your running stuff that then could be mapped uh, into Guac? Like, is that where it, is that not a starting point for you all? I, 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 I think it is fair to assume that that such a thing would exist. I mm -hmm. think the benefit though is that of like something like walk is that with like a vulnerability scanner, I'm not sure that you get the the granularity that you get from the s bomb. I think no. that's I think yeah. the that's like the the benefit, right? So yeah, but to be fair, like, having a running inventory is something that probably most organizations do have or should have. And maybe if your point is that like, it's probably fair to assume that that such, such a piece of infrastructure exists, then how do you join Guac to it is maybe right. the, the question to be answering. So. Okay. 
Yeah, I think related to that, as I think through like also, you know, the the attestation, because I, I think some of this, um, you know, one of the things that this doesn't answer, which I think is fine, is to say, well, if somebody is potentially running something and you don't know about it, this doesn't help you answer that question, right? Because you just be like, well, somehow they they got this thing running um, and and there's no like attestation node that it should be running in there. But I think it's it it it's still um like I think the what the attestation potentially also helps out with at least some level. Like once again, this is not necessarily saying that it's it's purely a runtime attestation. It could be like a it is allowed to run attestation. Um is is that sort of thing. It in the very least tells you like I assume that this is either running or is allowed to run. Um because when I when I start to look at like you know uh, I guess like there's a, there's a couple of questions that sort of open up here of like what happens if somebody is running some sort of monitoring and let's say they they list you know let's say they run OS query and they dump out the list of you know applications that are running on on a, a system at a given time um, what happens when one of those things uh, like is running but there is no associated is running at a station inside a guac or is deployed at a station inside a guac that usually like to me would indicate somebody deployed something to a system where that should not have happened <laughs> um uh and and so i think that opens up the the question of like it, it leads to the other challenge then of if you're let's say throwing these nodes in there if there is a discrepancy when is it like a bad discrepancy of like this somehow got in there versus we haven't done, we haven't generated the attestation yet because we pull every 10 minutes and generate the attestation every 10 minutes or something like that. I think that's like one of the other challenges I think that, that comes up once again, not necessarily one that can't be solved. Just one that I think is like worth uh, thinking through. Cause one of the things actually that I think a lot of the, um, uh, like the binary authorization style attestations and the the VSA style attestations that folks have been thinking through are related to thinking through running like this is timestamped at like with let's say a week long timestamp. So if let's say something is has the the deployed stamp, but no runtime stamp, that's fine. You, if there's a discrepancy, then you can tell that there's a discrepancy between what's, you know, like, okay, we just haven't pulled it yet and we haven't generated the is running attestation. But I think thinking through some of those things and 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 the timing around some of that is going to be useful to make sure that you also don't get like false positives of like, oh my gosh, something that shouldn't be running is running. And it's like, oh, it turns out it's because the is deployed attestation or is running attestation hasn't landed yet, something like that. Inside of Guac, I should say. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a lot of the the contention here is around like, what is a snapshot that we have versus what is in, what is reality, and so I think a lot of that can be solved with, at the moment at which you ask the question, give me the information at that moment, you know, as opposed to trying to to store things and and whatnot. So, yeah, that that might be a better approach and. Yeah, really appreciate the, the kind of discussion here. I think Alex and I will discuss a little bit further, maybe propose something that can, I, I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to be able to to provide something that works for anybody who's using Guac. I think that's kind of what we're trying to to land here. I mean, b integrating with bespoke uh, runtime, like observability systems, like where every organization has their own, it seems like a non-goal of of this right so that's that's kind of what we're trying to facilitate here but it also might be that that's not possible <laughs> so right like you you might be tied to whatever thing is observing and and, and scanning your your infrastructure yeah I, so, so that's kind of where i think like one of the areas to explore there is i agree don't go into every sub single person's bespoke thing and expect um, you know, it, it, it to make it try and make it work unless obviously like anybody who wants to build their own integration for Guac can do that. But um, I think one of the things I think we should look at is let's say like some of the open standards. So like open telemetry, for example, like or or you know uh, cloud events. Like hey, we we support cloud events so that hey, when a cloud event comes in, we can turn that cloud event into that attestation or something like that. 
or, or take that cloud event and record it as a node. So like, um, and I don't know if you're super familiar with cloud events, but like, you know, yeah, cloud event, you could just be like, there's been a scale up event on this thing that we now running this application. Great. Um, you know, uh, we can then just sort of generate that as a node. And then as that, like, as events come in, we can add additional nodes. I think like that's where I would focus versus, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to think through monitoring systems, and all I can think to is my time with Nagios, and and you know, and and uh, uh, so it's like, hey, you know, yes, there's some random like health check somewhere that you know should we integrate with every single person's health check? Probably not. Um, but if those health checks all support cloud events or support telemetry events that can say, hey, this thing is now running, I think we can you know say we support um, those common standards. Um, yeah, uh, if there's nothing else, we could kind of move on to the next topic. Um, and I just want to be clear here, like definitely reach out to me. I'm very interested in this problem, um, uh, myself. Uh, you know, I don't want it to sound like, you know, we're just saying, no, don't do this. Don't go down this route. I think we just have a lot of open questions and on exactly how this might all work. Um, cool. So, uh, so next up before kind of picking the next, um, I guess facilitator for the next meeting, one of the things that had come up previously was whether or not we should, uh, or sorry, uh, as we are progressing towards an eventual 1.0 release and as Guac has kind of grown and grown and grown to more participants and more contributors from lots of different affiliations, um, one of the things that's been brought up is like, hey, should we just have the one community meeting and a lot of asynchronous um, sort of collaboration in the Slack chat and one-offs, blah, blah, blah? Or should we start to have more ongoing, um, you know, like like similar to how Sigstore has a weekly, I believe, um, you know, has a weekly meeting and they have a couple of other meetings for a couple of the other different groups. Obviously, we're not that large yet, but do folks feel like we should be having this meeting more frequently? Uh, is it fine um, for this? Ben? Yeah, so I'll... Um... 100% of the meetings I've attended, we've been able to fit the entire agenda in during the the one month hour. Um, I would say from a community standpoint, you know, synchron an hour of synchronous video call is somewhat um, exclusive for a lot of people who could potentially contribute. Um, so, you know, sort of thinking about how we grow the community, I think trying to do as much asynchronously as we can. Um, is probably going to be a better approach if we get if we do get to a point where we're continually running out of time to have these in-depth discussions on things that we just can't hash out, you know, in a GitHub issue or in Slack, then you know I would be more supportive of increasing the meetings because um, we also do have the office hours, and I'm going to be leaning on the maintainers to uh, start having some more of their conversations in public as well. So I think that will um, address the sort of the, the root cause of the question, at least in the short term. Yep, that seems uh, reasonable to me. Um, yeah, so I think the one of the big what from what Ben mentioned, um, and and correct me if I'm I'm wrong here, Ben. It sounds like one of the big goals here is um, you know like obviously since in the past. Uh, Guac, the majority of maintainers and whatever have mostly just been a couple of folks who all knew each other. Um, and so when it came to like a lot of questions about Guac, it was much easier to just like tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, what's your thought on this? As opposed to um, in the in public and just like sort of in the public Guac chat in the Slack and say, hey, you know, and I think um, from what Ben is saying here is we should the maintainers uh, like myself and, and everybody, you know, Jeff and Parth, et cetera, should spend more time uh, doing that in public to make it very clear here that like, like if folks have other thoughts, they can come in and participate and to hopefully um, show, you know, the community that yeah, we want to be as open as, as possible here. And, and we welcome, you know, thoughts and contributions and, and also showing that this community is actually fairly active here. Uh, it just so happens that a lot of, you know, in the past, at least a lot of the activity has just been happening in one-off conversations and that sort of thing. All right. Um, so the last little topic here is um, uh, just picking the, the the person to uh, um, 
uh, facilitator for um, uh, the next meeting in June, which I don't remember exactly when that is. Uh, do we have that on the calendar? June twentieth, unless we're at adding a new one. Yeah. No, no. It sounds like. Uh, yeah. okay. So that is the week right before Cloud Native Security Con. Um, not that it matters. I just wanted to say that it's not during Cloud Native Security Con. So, so that is uh, it's not going to be an overlap there. I'm happy to take that on a some semi permanent basis or on a rotating basis, uh, whatever works for people. But. I have just no objections. Uh, <laughs> I don't hear anyone else begging to, <laughs> yeah. to lead the meeting. So, cool. Yeah, it's, it's yours. So now, actually, I'll hand it over to you to 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 take us out. <laughs> All right. Well, um, is there anybody who did not put something on the agenda that wants to use the last? two and a half minutes to discuss. And also if you didn't, I think I caught everyone who came in um, either as you put yourself on the attendees or I put you on there. Um, but if I missed it, then yeah, please add yourself. Uh, other than that, I suppose we'll uh, see we have, oh, actually I should mention this. Um, so we have the, Guac time office hours, Friday the 24th at 9 a.m. Eastern. And then we have a couple of sessions. Um, there's the open, there's an open SSF uh, talk that I'm giving on June 11th. And I'll share this information in Slack and in the meeting notes. And there's also one, I think with CNCF the week before, but I don't immediately see it on my calendar. Um, I don't remember who is uh, on the hook for that, but I will share that information. And uh, I guess we'll see you all there. Thank you.